All right, guys, so I was going to post this deck in a couple days from now, but I just didn't have the patience. <laughs> I'm so bad. <laughs> Anyways, we're back with another video, and this one's going to be Mages, right? We're going to be playing Inspired Zeal, and this is going to be my tweak version for 10.2. A little bit of an update. So I made a couple changes to it. There really wasn't a lot from the last patch. I took out the Istrid and put in the lock, and I think we called it a day at that point and then went to play test it on my server with some of you guys there as well just kind of hanging out and uh, seeing how it did we played for about two hours so there's a lot more games today than what i usually have in a video but uh since i had the recordings I might as well share them with you guys right so we'll go through the deck list here and we'll talk a little bit about the strategy we have amphibious assault to start with so this is an echo card that allows us to play a northern realms unit from our deck with provision cost of nine or less and boost self by one for each provision below the limit so most often we're going to be going into our deck here to pull out the bannard student and the artusa student early on so that we can have them start developing patience on the board this one plays on melee this one plays on ranged. We want to have these counters up to four for each so that we can later get the zeal for the alumni and do damage or do um, boost depending on which row or which one we played, right? So we definitely want to get them down soon. So you'll often find me going into Amphibious for that early on in the round so that we can get the best patience counters available. However, we do have other really good options here. Crazy point swings from the Carrick Marines if we pull those with the amphibious and they can help keep things alive if we naturally pull well into these carts so that's that you might find yourself going for a lock or letitia round one you might find yourself going for an alumni or a duel in round two or three so very versatile card echo gets to play it twice and uh really helps thin the deck out as well so we have chapter of wizards next it's a location with resilience and deploy spawn runeward order spawn a base copy to last allied bronze mage in this row that you played so what we're going to be doing is ideally playing an alumni and then clicking that to get another alumni an alternative to that could be if we're playing into a control heavy matchup we have to use this round one we can put down a student and click so then we get two of them on the board so if one gets taken away then we have the alternative one so that can help us really get at least one of these two four in the first round so definitely makes a difference there and just being able to play the card obviously gets a shield off the rune word and then we get the second one so it's, re it's just really good really good the only issue is that we don't have a way to tutor this card so you have to naturally pull it which is a little bit scary but i think in order to make this deck work right now it has to be that way because if we start putting on neuromancy and things of that sort then we take away from our top end here we got to sacrifice one or two cards and they could be key pieces to making it work i don't feel comfortable putting in you know taking out two duels to put in a nero and a bronze it uh, doesn't really make me happy doing that so this is the way that i'm going to play it for now we have uh gerhardt very simple card it has zeal so you can use it right away if you like on the order create and play a four provision spell now for every turn it has patience so for every turn we let it sit on the board and we don't click it this counter is going to go up by one so realistically if the patience counter was nine for example we could be rolling this card it's a spell right this card's a spell we won't get this card it's not a spell right so it's auto generated you get a few options you get to pick but there's some cards you just can't get right they have to be spell cards but you can kind of um you know really get this to where you need it to be if you do a little bit of research right so if you look at the spells we might get well vigo's muzzle is a possibility curse of corruption is not a bad idea but more than often you're going to be going for either a pact for a point swing five for the artifact compression getting a lock and reset really strong there um we have the option to go in for of course the practice makes perfect which works with this deck teleportation's okay but uh, my favorite one's the rune word so to be able to create and play another mage and give it a shield is actually pretty strong but more times if it's late game this will be worth more points than this 
it depends. If we have our alumni established, this could be a good high roll, but this is pretty consistent with resetting something that they have. And I've noticed that I've been winning games on the back of this card. So that's kind of what we have there. I don't feel it's necessary to put in the deck, but it's nice to roll off of with Gerhardt or at least have the option to. So use this card accordingly. And that's kind of how the mechanic works so that you can sort of make sure that it doesn't feel randomized and that you're getting what you want when you want it. So moving on to Shawnee next, we have Zeal with this card. Order summon a bronze human unit from your graveyard to this row and give it doomed with a cooldown of seven. So if we're going into a long round, this has to be probably the first thing you play. You want to get one of the students back out there so that you can keep establishing the patient's counter. And then obviously just really working the, the build up or carryover for when we do play the alumni. So that makes a big difference. But another reason why is the cooldown seven is hard to do twice in a round, right? We could naturally get the cooldown seven if this card stays alive for the cooldown period, or we can help speed it up a little bit with something like a winch. So winch is in here, obviously just getting the big boost is nice. It's inexpensive, but really plays well into the Shawnee. So that's something you want to save them for because it's really the biggest play that revolves around cooldown in the deck with exception to Rafford's. These two cards are enough to justify putting two of the winches in there. So yeah, I like to have two Shawnees in a round. If I can get two, it feels like it's a success story, right? One is okay and uh, none is a sad story. So that's that. We have Rafford's Vengeance here. Order, play a bronze unit from your hand and draw a card, cooldown five. So again, something we might need to speed up a little bit because as soon as the opponent sees this card, they want to remove this card and we want this card to stay. So you could go boost it with the Crystal Skull. It usually sees tall removal because you're also using a leader charge to give it zeal and then it puts it up to seven. So I don't like boosting it because then you've got to worry about, okay, it's at seven plus the four. It's an even better heat wave. It's an even better Yennefer's Invocation. So more than often, you'll see me not boost it and just try and get the value out as quick as possible. And uh, especially if we're taking winches on it, then the heat wave value, whatever the case, just goes through the roof. Imagine uh, we take two winches, a crystal skull, and a leader charge. It's wild, right? So you want to just play it safe with this card, I think. It's really good for consistency. This card's going to help us get our mages on the board quickly. Now, notice the bottom ability here. So when you play a unit next to the card, damage an enemy by two, mages contribute to the card's crew. So this is a crew ability. So if it's a soldier or a mage that we play against this card, when it's in crew, will dish two random damage to their side of the playing field. So if you see me today in the video putting cards that shouldn't be put beside it, like the Bannard student, I just dump it on the ranged roll maybe. Or if this is on melee and I dump the Artuza student beside it, there's a reason for that. It's for the immediate payoff on the damage because I don't think I'll have time to click the order later in the round. Or I anticipate that the opponent's going to remove this card anyways. Maybe we're playing into a control matchup and they have Gutting Slash or Dime Meridian Bomb or anything like that, right? We can just expect these to go, so we might as well take some damage points with us and, and, and do some on the deploy turn. So that's basically the reasoning for that. You can never have a perfect Vengeance because these are roll locked. So there's going to be cards that you want to play on the wrong roll on purpose. That's basically it. And obviously when you bring them back or you play the Alumni later on, then do what you're supposed to do. But round one's kind of like that. Now, on Seas and Selkirk, these are things I threw in because I played a game the other day against teammate Bart and he was running double duels and honestly um, it really helped him with that push potential and I figured you know what like let me take a page out of that book before I probably would have had Selkirk and maybe Adalia but I like the duels because Adalia feels a little bit slow into things that are very fast you don't want to play Adalia in round one necessarily but uh, you don't always have the best Adalia in round three. I figured double duel seems to be a way. It also seems to be a more effective way of using our leader charges than just Rafferts and forgetting about the rest. So that's kind of the reasoning behind that as well. John Natalis, I don't know if this was in his version, but it's certainly going to stay in mind for now. Um, just because it's one more way to get cards out of the deck. Because if, let's say, we have Raffords and it doesn't get like a long life and they take care of it right away before we've gotten two or three thins from it. 
then we don't really have the thinning we need to maybe pull cards like Chapter of Wizard and Gerhardt, etc. So again, having John really helps for either getting our Amphibious Assault or getting our winches, because these can be win conditions, believe it or not. Now, I didn't want to go too crazy in it, and I do see a line where you could take Natalis out, because we do have a lot of spell cards too, and casting contest and practice makes perfect, like these types of cards cannot be tutored from John. So there is that consideration there, but I think it's a, a comfortable play, right? If you wanted to keep the list like this as well, and maybe fit in another Warfare card, I don't mind playing something maybe in place of Margarita, like a Reinforcements. But I think Margarita is going to play for more points or more consistently than that place. So that's why I have it here. Now, Letitia is really cool because this card poses like an immediate threat. When the opponent sees this, they panic and they want to remove this before anything else. So oftentimes, if they remove Letitia, then they can't remove Rafford's Vengeance. And then this just really funnels out the students. And because the removal was taken away on the Letitia, the students get the stick on the board and get the patience orders up. So if this and this and this works, the deck is disgusting. But normally this gets answered and it allows these to work, which is to be expected. So that's just kind of how it is. That's kind of what we have to accept. And... The only way around that really is maybe you sacrifice a duel for a defender and then you try and do that route. But what happens is if, you know, we slow down our turn even more and all of a sudden now we're putting down a defender, then Letitia, then Raffords, and then we don't even have students on the board and they're almost ready to pass. So this is why I don't do it that way. I just want to have, okay, Letitia down, Raffords down, leader charge, cards, slam, 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 and wait and hope right? That's kind of how we're going to make it the most successful in my opinion. So that's kind of the whole place surrounding that. Margarita, it's a good lock with Zeal. If we want to play it proactively and wait, we can. It doesn't have to be on the ploy. So it makes a lot of sense. We could just probably lock something that we can't remove. We don't have a lot of like short removal. We might have to use a duel in some instances to kill a five or six or seven. So having this extra lock might you know stop that last threat of something that we couldn't take care of or helps us out if the alumni aren't established for damage enough to take care of threats so i'm feeling pretty comfortable with the margarita here alternative could be like a purify like i've seen people run the kudkudak which i believe now is a six which is okay if you're trying to keep devotion otherwise i'd go peller the alternative could be istrid i've used in the past but again, I felt like Istrid was one of those things where it sometimes saved us and sometimes it just played for six plus a couple boosts. So this is why it didn't make the cut here. I'm really dialing in on trying to make this as greedy and competitive as possible. So we have it like this. Now, alumni, again, if both values are equal or higher to four, gain zeal, order on melee, damage an enemy unit by the counter that we've established, right, from the Banard student. And if it's on ranged, then boost an allied unit by the number that we've gotten, you know, accrued from the Artuza student. That's basically it, right? And then we can reset those with cards like Casting Contest, boost it by five, reset its order ability. I like to just, you know, mainly take damage, but there might be times where we take boost instead. And you can just imagine how wild this gets. We're boosting something by five. We're setting it. Let's say it has patience five. This is playing for 10 points, but sometimes you can get them even higher. I had patience 17 in one of the games that I'm pretty sure you'll see today, right? It was crazy. Like we, we couldn't even finish that game because that game, Letitia worked. You see what I'm saying? But um, wild play. Imagine that off of five provision cards. So that's that. Sentry and Spellweaver, order damage unit by one, charge one, gain one charge whenever you play a mage or a spell. So you put these out early if you can, maybe bleeding into round two or opening on a round three or something like that. And then um, you basically just go and play your spells and your mages and you get extra charges. So this could get quite a lot of value. If you play these in around the time that you're going to be playing this, it gets incredible. Right? You play these in around the time you're going to be playing uh, the Gerhardt, it's going to get incredible because you're getting the double procs. 
right? You're playing, well, you're, you're playing basically like the Gerhardt, you're getting the one. You're playing the spell off of the Gerhardt, you're getting the two, right? And you can just see how it snowballs quite a bit. So definitely good to have in that spot. And uh, I've seen other replacements, but I found the spell weavers are pretty nasty. And we talked about Wench just helping with the cooldowns here. Practice makes perfect. It's a little bit of a consistency tool. Some people run two. I like one. It feels more comfortable because sometimes it plays for nothing. So shuffle an allied bronze mage into your deck to play a random bronze mage from your deck. Boost the unit you played by, and then there's a counter. So increase the boost by one for each unit with patience you played this game. So this is something that you want to play as many of these patience units as you can before playing, but it does have a cap. So we look at two, four, and then we have the five, six, right? So assuming we played all these first, and then played this, we'd get a boost by six to the unit that we drew, which at that point we'd hope would be an alumni that we're drawing or something like that, right? But we have to shuffle something back. So if something's boosted on the board already, then it's a problem. We want to take something that's been damaged or something that's its base power. So maybe you take an alum or a, a Centurion spell wafer at the end, or maybe they try and um, kill a Banner student and they hit it down to one or something like that, and then you just use the order and you, you toss it back and you look for something new and fresh. That's kind of what you want to do with that card. So that's why I don't have two of them because it takes a little bit to set up. It could work pretty bad if we don't have the right board state and the right deck state to support it. So that's basically it. Dex uh, revolves around these two cards essentially and these two cards. So these four cards are like the ones you just can't change. Um, the deck isn't the deck without these six cards total. So that's basically it. And Carrick Marine, just a really inexpensive way to get boost and help keep things alive on the board. And then of course the crew for the Raffords getting that extra uh, slap aside for the points is kind of nice. So that's pretty much the deck. Hopefully that makes some more sense if you're new to playing mages, but um, I've got a ton of games for you guys today. Like I want to say there's around 10 games. It's pretty wild. So we'll get into commentary for those ones there. The commentary is going to be post game commentary. I was in another conversation while recording the games. So I'm going to go back and speak on them and kind of talk about what was going on and what the strategy was for each of these games. And um, let me know what you guys think. I definitely think that mages can be played because all in all, we went, uh, it was 11 and 5 during the stream today, which wasn't half bad. And we played, the, the losses came from just them answering our, these cards here early on in round one and not letting us get the values high enough for the alumni. So if the opponent can shut down this line of play, then you're in trouble. Otherwise, you can just really go nuts with it. So that, that's what I have for you guys today. And um, another note, if you guys want to participate or view the deck building experience and catch me playing some games and chatting and stuff like that, by all means, hop in the Discord server. It's a lot of fun when we do stuff like that. And I plan on doing more of that. So that's pretty much it. We'll get into the games here and I will see you guys tomorrow. All right, and for the first game here, we got Skellige Onslaught, and man, I just took a little nap, just woke up, so <laughs> a little disoriented, but I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna get this done right now. So let's get into it. For round one hand, we wanna have the students, we don't wanna have the alumni, because the alumni trade down so bad in round one they're the payoff cards so you have to tuck them back because generally with patience we want to actually play a very long round if possible so having these cards may result in us needing to play them and it's just not what we're looking to do now i'm thinking here that the hand's too good so i go and tuck back the on that was basically it And I'm not going to boost Letitia because I think Letitia is a valuable heat wave for them. And I'm willing to trade, I think, the two leader charges that they just gave for that one card. Now we can just focus on maybe getting the students online as soon as possible. And the nice thing about it too, though, is that... Yeah, there we go. So... 
with their leader charges out of the way, it might actually allow the students to work. I think we just let that be. And I was hoping that they wouldn't value damaging the boost students as much because I'm expecting them to have one or two tall punish, right? I'm expecting to see maybe a Mork Varg in two rounds or a Mork Varg in a heat wave or something of that sort. A lot of people are running non devotion right now. We have to lock that though, otherwise, it just uh, really defeats the purpose here. They're going to just ping down our lowest things every single time, and that's going to be the students every single time, so. Now we got to get student number two out there. We need the banner. We have the R2s, the student down already. And I actually realized, like, um, today is probably the first time I call them by their names. Normally I just say the melee row one and the range row one. And just hope that you guys know what I'm talking about. So, a couple things. We could go in for our amphibious and then maybe take a marine to boost up the student. Or we could just cram the other student. But uh, I'm thinking that they're going to try and push for us to lose on even in round one. Right? We see the leader charges come down, some commitments come down. We're already at, uh... Okay. I guess I chose not to. It's not dead, so, yeah. That's not bad. But, uh, yeah, we're already, like, pretty much down here. If they pass, we'll take it. But otherwise, then we're, we're not doing so good. They're gonna play here. Now, we don't have to leave the round at five, right? We still have some good push. So... An example of that would just be like the um, the amphibious, right? I'm just thinking here. I see the winch countdown is actually pretty close. Like, I'll, I'll boost it up just so that we can get it done quicker. But it's a good tempo play. And then we have amphibious, like... At this point, I'm pretty confident that we'll find the space to get out of the round. Um, I think we still leave that other student working here, and then... Should be alright. So we got the pass we're looking for. We didn't even have to play AA. If they would have went and continued to play, then we would have played AA there. Maybe just took a Marine or something like that. Uh, put a crew, boosted maybe the four, and then I think we would have been fine. Maybe Morkvarg would have been the play after that for them. I don't know. So, counters are okay. Except uh, we need more on the Bannards, right? So, looking at this, I'm thinking, alright. Do we actually bleed? Because if we don't get zeal for the alumni, I don't feel confident that they'll stick. So, I'm trying to develop a hand here that's good enough to push. Because I'm feeling pretty daring in this case. Yeah, we just want to get that counter up. See, the the range is fine. It's six. This is three. And uh, just hoping that this will be enough here. If they hit that student out, then we're, yeah, we're in trouble. I didn't want to go tossing leader charges just to keep it going, though. What I've noticed though with these mages is that with a lot of control going around right now you might have to put yourself in a lot of uncomfortable situations to to get it done. So what I mean by that is like pushing in situations like this where 
Normally we just want to retreat to a long round three. I just don't think that in a long round three we have the advantage because uh, they'll be able to just like buckle down with the control and just answer everything one at a time comfortably, right? Like seeing cards like this come out here, it's painful, but we're still ahead enough that I believe we can get another turn here. So it's kind of the idea. Now, it's probably going to have to be Alumni and Range Row. Significant difference in terms of the value there, right? The counter at 6 versus the counter at 3. If I was to play something here, yeah, the Spellweaver comes down because we can start engineing off of that, right? Before we start playing a bunch of mages. And you see what I mean here, like... There comes a point where they decide, I guess, that they're not going to give us the card. They were playing a little bit slower, but now we're starting to see some commitments. And on one front, that sucks, but at the same time, it's pretty good. Because now we don't have to deal with these things later. So imagine going into round three, we have Fukusha, we have Skiurl. Like all these things are kind of annoying. And so now I'm just trying to find some room to get out because um, I'm pretty happy with the commitments that we're getting here, right? Leader being one in round one, and then these gold packages here in round two. And now we're starting to get into the good cards. The further you go with the bleed, obviously the more will pay off, but you have to figure out an escape plan. So mine includes maybe even taking the alumni here because if I can somehow get card back then last say uh, Gerhardt's really good right so we'll try and distribute the points as best possible because we don't want them to, to punish us here 2819 so again if there's an opening we leave if there's not we take the casting and we probably put the boost onto the um, the Selker and see we get Harold down so now I'm like nope yeah range row there we go so I'm pretty happy with these trades now but it really just comes down to if we can't get card back I think we lose and this is why I believe they're starting to really expend yeah so this is actually the place we'll do it so either their hand's really bad, or they uh, they just didn't want to get templed on and steamrolled. But either way, I'm happy with what we saw in return. The provision trade wasn't like... We played Selkirk, and we essentially played, um, you know, the um, Shawnee, right? That's really as bad as it is. We took a thin... Yeah, we're all right. It was the first amphibious we saved from round one, which is kind of nice. So it gives us the ability to bring it up in round three. That's actually perfect. Um, I don't like floating marines, so I'd rather use something a bit more proactive because we're not going to be putting down the Gerhardt from hand. We're going to be waiting till last turn, I think, for that. We want to actually... It's unfortunate with the alumni that we have to actually sit that card. But at least we can make another one when we play like the first one, right? And then I'm thinking, okay, if we play two at the same time, they can't answer both at the same time. That's basically it. Right? Maybe they take out one, but with the orders going on, one of them has to work, right? The other issue is that, okay, we know last card's probably Morkvarg, right? So we don't really want to use the orders here. So I'm thinking, okay, we take the Amphibious while we can. Marine's going to be the most points, but not yet. We don't want to use it just yet. We want to sit there and wait just to be certain. 
And then once they play whatever it is, we can go and hammer it all down, right? And bear in mind, when I was playing these games, I was showing a couple people how the deck works. So, in this case, I go ahead and I play down, but so did the opponent. Um, there we go. You know, lots of points we're able to actually preserve, keep safe during this game. So, we got a pretty comfortable win. And moving on to the second game, here we got Nilfgaard Double Cross. I think this deck likes blue coin, but I feel more comfortable playing it on red because we have a lot of like low tempo plays with just putting down students at four and waiting. So it's easier to punish this deck if the opponent's going second. Now, I like this hand because we have a winch for the Raffords Vengeance and we have a bunch of bronze cards in hand. That's kind of what you want. If I was to go back here though, I was looking mainly towards the Marines and wasn't really considering row. I probably would have put the Raffords on melee so that the students that we play get a bit more value here, right? Because now in order to hit the crew, then we're putting them on the range row. But at the same time, the opponent probably has another joust and all that, so it's not, it's not all bad. So I believe we just saw Sunset there, right? These days I always recommend look to see if the opponent's hand is moving because the way, if they have Sunset, it really affects the way that you play the game. Um, I feel like we're going to struggle for getting... Getting this crew back. So may we actually just play the other student on melee in this case and just give up on on the crew sandwich you know what I mean I want to have one that I can actually play so I'm deciding here if that's the way to go about it and I decide yeah yeah, it's good we have enough of a lead so that we can get out if we need to but what we do need to do that's unfortunate is uh, get the range student down so again respecting that and just putting it here is good and now that they're both sitting there comfortably we've got the Artuza and the, the Bannard, we can just kind of maybe play a Marine or two, try and get their patience higher, keep the opponent in the round, and get out. That's it. Our job is pretty much accomplished here. One and one, or one and three, rather. So one of them will have that four that we're looking for. It's unfortunate because we can't, um, you know, we, we don't get the zeal on the alumni. And, and this is kind of one of the reasons why I don't put a defender, guys is if we put a defender, it's prolonging this process even more. Picture us also pulling into Letitia, right? So if I go defender down, Letitia down, then start putting students down, well, you could see how we already didn't get the order, like the counters of four that we're looking for. So it would be even worse if we had defender. It's kind of like the risk you have to take to get the better reward, and I think it's more than often worth it. Because there's ways that you can boost up the students, and what are the odds that they have like four or five, four power removal cards in hand, unless you're playing against like low unit and that's all they're playing, right? So, I put this one down on melee first, because it has a lower order and I'm hoping that it's not as attractive to the opponent. And then when we, or if we reset the Shawnee, we can pull out one of the other students that already has an order established because that would be something that we'd feel inclined to use this round. It's kind of the idea. So now if they take any sort of removal on me, I'm hoping that they direct it towards the Shawnee because we could still pass seven. It's kind of like our last chance here to get it to work. And like I would say a very experienced player would know kind of the, the strategy here and they'd probably go for the student before the Shawnee even if it's on the wrong row. But um, it's worth a try at least. And so what I like to do... Let's 
second year. Just getting a phone call. Yeah, I was going to say, what I'd like to do is take the chapter, and then we can use that potentially as carryover, right? You, so we don't have to click the order in this round, we just get it started. And then if things get ugly here, we leave at 7, we take that with us the next round, we play an alumni, we click it, it works, right? But uh, depending on what we continue to see here, it will decide if I continue to play. So I'm not overly convinced that we saw enough in exchange, right? Just a Vigo and that's pretty much it. So we gotta get that point contrast going on here, that's fine. So now it's increasingly difficult for them to do it in one card unless they take leader. And notice how they kinda damaged down the Artuza student and just forgot about it at one. So it's still ticking guys, like it's still doing its thing and that's what we need, right? Just looking at my counters here, we got four and five. So we got the zeal on the alumni established. That's basically what the goal of this round was. That, and to get some gold cards. So I still don't like long round against Assimilate. This has been a tough matchup for us. It's probably one of the worst matchups. Because they have the like the ability to replay a lot of these cards, and they just do so well for them. So I don't know if you caught it, but it looks like they roped. So we take advantage of that and cram down a card. I believe they lost Brathens here. Was it Brathens they lost? Or did they play that last round? They lost something. Uh, I wasn't really sure at the time. I'm not really sure right now, but a card has been lost, so it helps us out quite a bit. And uh, we've got a 20 point lead. So Sunset comes out, which is nice. We've established our own carryover through the alumni and through the chapter, and then we've taken away some of theirs. So unless they have a way to sort of like recomp their hand and like push that Sunset back, it's coming out this turn which is actually really good for us because even if it does, I think that we have the means to still get out of the round. It's probably, what, like 10 points? 12, 13, maybe? It's not, uh, well, maybe not that much. But it can't be that much at this point of the game, right? Ten points, there we go. So this is what I'm talking about. Now we can even work on the second counter. And it just gets worse and worse, right?
it's it's actually already done more than I've anticipated. Like getting to eight is perfect. You get the added little synergy from having the sunset if you're wondering why the token spawned as well. Has the Witcher tag. But yeah, I kind of want to defend card here. We need to get the card back. So it might involve some sort of commitment on this turn. 8's kind of a big number here. See, it's like something I wanted to boost, but then again, I kind of don't, but it's probably good that we just have it continue to grow. And so many points. Like, this should be fine. Like, even if they were to somehow take Terran over here and take Leader, yeah, there's Leader. They're like, all right, this says actually kind of bad now. You know what I mean? And I decided to get rid of the carryover because I really wanted to get the push from them as well. They're not devotion. That'll play for five points total. I think at this point of the round, maybe they should have played... Um, the marine but I'm deciding all right that's enough we got to get out of this one here we have some point slams from the amphibious and from the marine here last say is confirmed we just go about it this way maybe they have to play two cards right it's a pretty steep lead if you think about it That's not going to be enough, yeah. So we went from being card down to card up, and I think that's important. And we got the leader out of the way against a very scary matchup. Now, we just have to make sure we pull into enough. Look at this student. We play one of these from hand. So we could have potentially took him in two. There's like two very slow plays when we passed. But I think what we did here might secure it. Because now Terra Nova into a duel is a thing. Because they actually gave spying to the Onseus, right? Okay, there we go. Just showing you guys we missed uh, Gerhardt. And we actually pulled off crazy numbers for the alumni without even having Letitia in this game. So I'm feeling pretty good about that as well. And we have the alumni. And we can reset the order and go about it that way. Now, we can't float anything. Like, I can't float the duel. And this is, like, the disheartening part. Like, we have to actually probably play the alumni on melee for 5 damage. Opposed to playing it on range for the 12th. Because um, anything we play here gets dueled. And uh, it's a sad story. All that hard work. <laughs> but we have to adapt. So it's all right. If we deny points from them, we should just win the game anyways, right? And they have Assimilate Engine, so we take them at 5 because that's all we have to deal with since we're doing damage here. And uh, then we can just float a duel. Use the duel with the boost even if we can with the Marine. And yeah, we just win in this case. 
but I will be right back. I gotta make a phone call. Alright, so I'm back here. We got Nilfgaard double cross up next. While I was gone, I made a snack. One of my favorite things ever is sesame seed bagel, cream cheese, and uh, smoked salmon. It's like top five. I thought you'd be able to like hear my stomach in the mic. Like it was, <laughs> it was getting pretty loud. So back to back matchups against the same deck. We've been playing against it so much over the last two days. And our hand's not bad here. Maybe tuck a winch. It would be nice to have vengeance with all the bronzes in hand. So I'm thinking, okay, this gets attorney joust, but Letitia gets the envo. What's better to play first? Play Letitia just to see if they'll do it. I'm not going to boost it though because I think it's going to be taken. Sure enough, they take it here. So now at least when we put down the first student, it'll survive. We can play it down, put the skull on it, and I'm expecting that they can't answer it here. So while they're rolling Diplos, you know, you want to go ahead and just put the other student down. <clears throat> and then once we put the Artuza student down, we can try and take some Marines, keep them going. Because I'm sure that they'll use something that gives it damage, right? As you a little bit worried about like a ping and a coup, but we'll have to deal with that when it comes. Alternative here is, you know, going into the Amphibious next turn and just getting another one. So there's that. Just taking some time between the plays to sip the coffee a little bit myself. I have like this timer in my head. Six, seven minutes after I brew is when I start sipping. It's when it's the best. And then uh, it goes downhill from there. So, we could still get out of the round, which is fine. I think playing there is okay. I think we definitely need to go and take the other student, though. Bear in mind, I'm just, um... I'm watching this back now with a little bit of a different idea than maybe at the time I was playing it. Because, uh... I was... I was chatting while playing, but um, I want to see the deck state because I'm pretty sure we have the other student in there, the Artuza one. You want to play that on Range Row so we can start working on it as they continue to push into the round. But uh, at this point, it doesn't really matter. It's not like we really missed a lot of the patience counter. At the end of the day, it would have been like up to three maybe, and now it's going to be up to one, so it's, it's not really that big of a deal. We can pull back that student with the shawnee and just finish the uh the order of four this one's already at four it'll be at five at the end of the turn so yeah that's all right
And so we have to decide pretty quickly if we want to push this round. Again, wanting to set some things up a little bit makes sense. Seeing chapter here kind of gives me a bit more confidence with the push. We have some ways to thin the deck out a little bit. And we'll just tuck back John there. Take the Amphibious off the John, I think. So, I, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to play with this first turn, which is why I took this first. So, it was just a play for carryover, and depending on what they play as a result, then um, I'll continue to push, but uh, this is partially why I just put the card on the range row. Just throwing it down to get the location on the board and all that sort of thing. Now I'm thinking, okay, their response to what we did was pretty slow. We'll just go back in here, get this card on the board, and then just go from there. So the counter is really important. We got the joust out of the way, so now this could actually stick. And then we can sandwich off the Rafferts here. And I'm pretty sure the next play is going to be a mistake. There's a mistake somewhere. Um... I'll point it out if I see it, it's just from what I remember. I think it had something to do with Vengeance and Shania's crew, and uh, that just came down to a lore misplay. Should have just read the card, basically. I was thinking Mage at first, but she counts as human status for Tag. Yeah, so I put it to the right when it should have been put to the left in replacement. You see what I mean? We missed the points. Gotta be careful though, because if... You know, if you just slam jam cards like this, the little things can add up. Now, I caught the play right away, so I didn't continue to make that same mistake. However, imagine, right? Because a lot of the points come from this combination. It's putting those cards beside the Raffords. Like, it's almost as valuable as just getting that thinning value that it gives initially itself, right? I think that they should have tried to break the crew, but it's often overlooked. So we could take a duel, we could take a lock, or we could take an amphibious. I don't mind a duel, I'm just trying to decide where it wants to go. I think Assimilate makes more sense if we're going to be taking a duel than the student that's sitting at 4 plus order. Because we have the mage um, torturer in the front row, right? But uh, John here's fine. And I guess they didn't have the hand to fight the push, so we get the win there. Moving on to the next one, here we have Jackpot Syndicate.
So cards I don't want in first hand, practice makes perfect is bad. First hand is really bad. Winch sucks without cards that have cooldown. Casting contest is obviously not really good in round one because it's one of the big payoff cards for the game. So I often see people using them on the Marines round one, calling it a day. But uh, you miss out on huge potential in round three with those cards. So I like to get rid of them so that I don't start thinking about using them in round one. Pretty simple. Now, we'll just do the same thing we, we've been doing is just go in with this one first, next one second, and then just double up. Now, I like taking the damage as a priority because, you know, it, I think it's valuable to have damage on the board opposed to the boost, but if we're playing into like a low unit type deck, then we might find ourselves favoring the range throw because we want to be able to maximize the value that we're getting from them, so. And there's nothing we can do about that, so it's going to really mess up the flow. So we just keep going. Like, I wish I had another ranged student, because that would be the time that I would play it. Or if I had access to Amphibious. So, they're Poison Syndicate. Um, they're not Bounty Syndicate. Which gives me some confidence here. And I don't think they have another pair of Poisons in hand. Usually they have one pair they'll carry into a round, or maybe like a one-off third. Just in case, but... To have four is kind of a commitment. And so, having said that, they know, we know, that if they can't stop these engines, it's going to be game over for them. So, we pretty much just win the game because of it. And that's the crazy part about it. Like, if you can't stop this engine, all these engines, there's so many of them, then we usually just win. I thought I trimmed this, I'm sorry dude. <laughs> Gonna have to sit through this one for a little bit. Not not too much longer though. There we go. And uh, moving on to the next one here. It's a little bit of a shorter game. Um, <clears throat> There's something I just want to bring up in this video. This is more of a lesson than uh, than a serious game. Revolving Saskia, because I just put out a Saskia deck, it would have been yesterday. And some of you guys might want to make your own tweaks to it, which is fine. But you got to make sure you have enough tags for Saskia in the deck. So make sure you have 10 unique categories. Nature cards, for whatever reason, didn't count when Saskia came out. I realized that in my first time I ever played it. So make sure you're not counting nature cards. However, everything else counts. But Saskia doesn't bring out neutrals Saskia brings out Scoitel units so that's also something that you have to make sure you know you've got going on right and you see nothing happens here so uh, I'm thinking okay they obviously didn't meet the deck conditions or they have every bronze card in their hand and uh just a, a win here. <clears throat> but I think it was more of the conditions thing than anything. Moving on to more of a serious game here. Um, we have Inspired Zeal. So it's Mages or it's Siege, right? That's like the big two right now, or it's a bit of both. I think that with the Siege Masters and a little bit of a hybrid version of this deck, it is probably one of the stronger decks in the game right now, but I also think that, well, <laughs> I know that I felt like just playing mages. Um, I just felt like going all in for like a complete mage, you know, flesh that archetype for this video. So this is what we have. But if I was to make some, uh, like some adjustments in order to make it work that way, 
probably have to be like Marines go. Then the Siege Masters come in. And then maybe like the Hen Selt comes in. And then you would maybe take out the casting contests for uh, a Carol Ballista or a Reinforced Ballista. Probably be something like that. I haven't messed around with it too much. Again, or maybe actually, no, the spell weavers go. That's what it would be. You you would ditch those. Yeah, spell weavers go. Two siege engines come in. Henselt comes in. You would ditch the marines and you take yeah. It's probably the marines. It could also be the winches, but I think you want the winches. But anyways, back to this game. A um, couple spell weavers down because I don't have access to my... This is like pretty bad too. We need to have some of these students down. And uh, we can pull one off of the amphibious, but that's about it. Are we going to take that? It's not too late for us. We could still play this uh, this round here. Yeah, we'll go ahead and take this here. You see that? Anything alive would be dead now. I want to get rid of that Carbalista. I'm just thinking, is it worth a duel or is it just uh, something we gradually poke at here? All we kind of really want is at least this card to survive long enough to make it count. And they're really working on it here. Boiling oil will take it out. Right, with the, um, the resupply. Yeah. So they've played this matchup a few times. They know... So, I kind of faced like a bad situation because if we let them win the rounds and we haven't established the patience, so it's like actually very dangerous because round control with not having any carryover is bad, or losing round control. So, I kind of want to win the round so we have the ability to kind of decide where it goes. And so we just have to play this to get out, which is unfortunate, but it works. There we go. It's not an overspend. Two points is fine. Just gonna apply to a message or two. One second here. I'm thinking, okay, nothing to lose here. If it's Siege, I gotta see something, right? We missed a lot of good cards. But Chapter should carry quite well. Nice. And this is the problem, like, it's not a problem with mages, but it's something that needs to be understood when you're playing mages. Are these very uncomfortable situations you have to put yourself in in order to win games sometimes. So, it's not for everyone. There were a few games where even I was feeling, wow, this is too much, you know? But, um, it's, I believe it's the way it has to be. 
because it comes down to that patience mechanic and that patience mechanic gets us riled up. So we're going to be going into, yeah. And at this point, I'm thinking, okay, we need points. We need a lot of points and we need them now. So that's basically it kind of keeps us in here and then we can even consider going for a duel coming up next um, I'm not even opposed to that that's actually becoming a better dual target right or a lock but uh, locks a little slower I'm trying to best set up an all-in situation. So I know that that's probably the only way we're gonna get card back because if they have Siege, they're desperately holding onto it. And with the way that this deck thins out, I'm pretty confident that they have Siege. So this is why I'm really forcing it here because the longer they take to play this scenario, the less points it'll play for. And if they put it down last, then it's a four-point turn, right? Or five points, if you want to consider the turn end proc, uh, the passive ability of the, uh, the engine. Boost by five, so this could just clean out the, uh, yeah. I think that's the one we actually take out. Just go for value here, points. And, uh... I flex the zero point damage there, just because I honestly want, uh, I needed a couple extra points anyways. I didn't think we'd be able to do it with a 10 point gap, pretty much, because they have their leader too. I suppose I could have left it though. Like, I didn't have to click it, but it was just kind of, it's cool that no number came up when I hit. Like, nothing happened. Like, I'm surprised it would give you that ability to actually go use it for zero. In case you were wondering. But you see what I mean here? Boom. So, we, we got the scenario down. We got the hand self out of the way. Like, that's the push that we needed to make. And, um... Now I'm feeling pretty good. Right? Now it's whoever top decks better. And that, to me, that's better odds than, um... And what we would have had if we passed earlier, right? We, we would have just got steamrolled. So Rafford's here, they don't give it zeal for whatever reason. I have to take advantage of that, right? It could just very well be that they have no bronze cards in hand, so we'll look into this right now. Yeah, there's a special. We warm that up. It's all we have. We'll take a marine, I think, off the Shawnee. That's uh, the wrong duel, but I don't think it would have made... Let's see. We'll, let's see what it is. Shawnee comes down. So we would have had the... The 9, 10, 11, 12, plus... The we would have won either way, right? All right, and for the next one here, we have Skellige, and it's going to be Ursine Ritual. So it could be a couple things. It's either going to be Lippy or it's going to be the Self Wound Archetype. I kind of have to prepare for both, right? 
that's the tough part about the bait leader situations. When you think it's one thing, it ends up being another thing. It can really affect your mulligans for the round one. Um, Winch here is not very good, but I also could just tutor John. I wanted to hold on to Winch in case we pulled something with the cooldown, like the uh, the Rafferts, right? And again, playing into what I think is probably like uh, a lip or sorry, a self wound matchup at this point. But again, with the possibility of Lippy, I don't think we take the boost on the Letitia from the Crystal Skull. I think we leave it the chance if they lock it, and uh, we just play into like a, a subpar heat wave, right? Okay, we see Roach. I'm thinking, okay, it's probably not self-wound. Unless they've adapted that card into that deck, but the odds are likely because having played self-wound a few days back, I realized that a lot of cards are up in those higher provision slots that you want to play. And um, if anything, you don't have enough room for all of them. So it's got to be lippy based on that. <clears throat> Kind of just hope for one on each. So, I was thinking that if they didn't deal with the Letitia by now, they didn't have the means to. So, I didn't click it. But that would have been the turn, if you were getting kind of worried about it, that you'd probably want to go ahead and use the order. Because we had both students out. And we had a couple turns of order, like, of patience on the Letitia. So, yeah, Lippy confirmed at this point, I'm thinking. And I'm thinking round loss uneven confirmed. We just have to play cards, though. That's basically it, right? If they do let up and decide to pass, we still have the reach to actually go ahead here. No, this is like crazy the amount of commitments here. Blue boy, almost full leader. Like, I think you had me before that, because we've already spent to Amphibious, right? And if I had Raffords, I probably would have played it by now, if you think about it. So I think the full blue, blue boy um, crank was maybe unnecessary. We can even think about maybe playing Chapter here, and the reason why is because if we're going to take a loss on even, we know they're going to push. That's basically it. Um... On the next turn, I think I got distracted. I made a mistake. I'll point it out when I see it. Costed us like two points. Like, I was thinking about the wrong mage. And I was like, oh damn. <laughs> I was thinking it was one of the other ones for a second. But uh, I realized we played the, the one off the uh, rune word. But it's not really a big deal. We just take a duel and we get ahead here, right? So we'll take the duel for the most points so that we can save the order of one of the students. That's at four, that's at three. So we'll use this damage so that, you see what I mean? I guess it didn't really make a big difference, but I, I like Selkirk, just like, quick play round three. I suppose, like, on say it's a little bit more flexible with the damage that it can do on deploy instead if you just put it on the melee row, but 
Yeah, it's fine. Kind of understanding what happened in round one. Obviously, I wasn't super happy with the misclick, but um, we got what we needed out of the round, and they should have pushed harder, I think. Uh, I think you had it. I would have had to concede there early and then just try and defend a bleed, but the fact that they gave me the round means I think we win the game because Lippy's really good in pushing in round one and in bleeding in round two. Lippy's not great in the long round three because a lot of the strategy just revolves around bringing out cards for points, whereas other decks are playing more engines. So you have to kind of respect the fact that, you know, you will get passed in a really long round. And so going to a full long round here, especially with we with the patience we have uh, developed, it's going to be extremely difficult for them, I think. And also, they didn't even flip the deck yet. I like to be able to bleed in round two, flip the deck in round two, or just before round three, and then start the third round with either flipping the deck or doing the serious play. You know, but a short round three, like a three or four card round three, of course. And then you're able to throw out 40, 50 points in three turns. So, when we see the 21 points come down right now, it feels more like an intimidation tactic than anything because we know that's like one of the big plays. So we want Shawnee to come out of the th like soon, but we also want to use the um, the Rafford soon. We just take that student, keep going. The longer we get from this, the better we get from this, right? And I'm looking at, okay, a lot of their control tools are out of the picture, except for that one. But it's fine. Like, it, it did its job, that's all. Now, cooldown of 6 means that we can pull off Shawnee one more time in this game. So we'll at least be getting the points from that. And then just start playing Spell Weavers, and if we need to keep something alive, we have the Marine for that. Fakusha <clears throat> in a Lippy Dex kind of cool. I don't know if the idea was to Fakusha Lippy and then do it again. Or it was just to do something like that. Like to bring out the blue boy. Or maybe the Cirrus. I don't know. I don't usually run it in my Lippy decks. Kind of checking the counters here. I think we could still jam cards. It's especially important that we lock the blue boy as well. Um, they might have something to proc it, but at the same time, we're going to be just doing randomized damage, and we could give them some value from that. So it's one of those things. They take the heat wave here, but a lot of the damage has been done. We only had one more proc for that in hand anyways. Maybe if we pulled something a second, but... There, that's damage. We could actually just go and play this here. We've got the zeal. I think we have to value the damage more than the boost because they could have some nonsense like a row reset or whatever the case. 
and you, you start to see they're sort of plateauing at 30 points, give or take, that they're able to maintain per turn, and then we're just now starting to climb. So it's like the period of the game where we're getting that payback for what we've done in a good way, right? Okay, Heat Wave's out of the question, Blue Boy's out of the question. We saw the deck twice. I'm thinking we probably didn't miss anything. That's probably it. We could probably just greed this card, right? Be nice to get it to six. Take another rune word, basically. Now that was, um, yeah, this game I was like, I was very distracted. Um, I would have probably taken the Marine at this point in the game instead of the other student because it's the wrong row. So it doesn't really matter so much. Like for the patience counters, you, you are increasing them, yes. So I guess it's not all bad. But I'm just thinking, Marine plays for uh, seven points. This plays for the four plus the additional counter on any potential alumni. So it's probably just more with the Marine, right? Would have been nice if we had chapter for that, but it's fine. We're just going with the alumni. And we might as well benefit from what we did with the... Uh, the other student, but... Um, that's basically it. Casting goes tall, but I think we still went to a heat wave, right? The safer option is probably just the... That's fine. Split out the points a little bit. And I'm playing here, um, I actually thought they played down to nothing at the time. Very distracted game, but um, yeah, that's kind of the point potential that we have. I sent the GG because it's my bad that uh, I play when they passed. I, it's not really good taste. Now, moving on to the next one here, a little bit more focused up. We got Precision Strike, and it's hard to tell because there's so many different variants that go around, like... This could be the orbs one, this could be the no unit one, right? Maybe a bit of both. So it's looking more low unit, which is why we want to prioritize getting uh, getting the double units on the row really quick. And in this matchup, we might even play like our melee students on ranged because we need to keep the row stacked a little bit. It's a tough spot to be in because they can they can really just clean up this uh, row pretty quick. Like the Madoc click plus a leader and like a rebuke or something like that. And all of a sudden we have no cards on the board. Or a bomb, another bomb, right? So we see traps and 
<laughs> we got a serpent. That's actually a good serpent. I suppose if we're going to play something, uh, yeah, we probably just want to put down, like, um, the Banard student at this point. If they answer that one, we have another one, right? Ah. It's pretty much the same thing. Go at it again, see how it goes, and then we can just use the Marines afterwards. Lock's kind of bad here, but just looking at the counters, one and one, okay. Like, in this situation, the points are so close that you want to keep playing, and um, we want to get some security here, so we we'll start building up these counters. And because they are like a low unit playstyle, I opt for the adept, uh, sorry, the uh, Artuza student instead. just want to pull off the Shawnee play because that's huge if we can get Shawnee into this next turn then we can automatically go and we can reset that order bring back one of the other students right it makes a big difference it's more for just getting the zeal and the alumni than it is to use the damage So that's all right. We managed to pull it off. Get the one and the two. We take the two. And like, obviously we can go and we could take maybe a leader charge on that to protect it, but I don't think it's worth it. If it's gonna get answered, it's gonna get answered. So we just have to deal with it. I was thinking that this is probably a pitfall because we're playing towards the end of the round. But that was actually a really good play for them. On a pass, we still have a duel off the Saber and we take it. So that's probably the play. We're not going to get a much better duel, I don't think, in this matchup than that one right there. There we go. And we're one card down, but we have a leader charge, and uh, I think we should push a little bit, I th yeah, to get out some of these annoying cards. It's one of those matchups where if we go into a long round three, they like that better.
but if we bleed them in round two, then <coughs> excuse me, then um, we get out some of those key pieces for their end game combo. Just finishing up the coffee there. We'll switch to water. <clears throat> So it's not a really good hand, but I still think we need to play. And I say it's not a good hand because we have a couple, like a lot of special cards and we have one unit. So Serpent Trap, like if they make another one off Hattori or something like that, we get extraordinary value because we just would have no points. I suppose we just take this here. So we've got the damage quite high. I'm thinking, okay, they'll play something. I'll just, I'll just keep trying to kill what they play if possible. I just gotta see more traps before I go. And if they play a trap here, then we're good. Because then we get that card back that I'm looking for. There it is. So we can't interact with our order. We might as well just pass here. And that's the play. See, you know what I mean? Like very uncomfortable round, very awkward round, but I think you have to see it through sometimes. And then short round three, we don't really care too much. But you have to expect a couple uh, traps, like, of course. Pitfall trap's going to be here. I'm thinking pretty early on, especially in a short round when we have a lot of expensive cards. So I'm thinking about taking Chapter of Wizards early, just so that we can get that trap triggered and something like the duel doesn't get killed when we play it. Also, if you guys have this game board, I figured out today that you can click on that snowman. Whoops. You can click on that snowman and kill it. Like, it'll... It, like, falls apart. So try that one out. So see what I mean? They got a zero point. And uh, next play is pretty predictable, right? The first pitfall didn't work out. I see they're deciding on something. I'm thinking it's a Tori. And I'm thinking that they're going to go ahead and try it again. So I decide to go play the less expensive card, right? The least. We've got just the five damage, which is okay. At this point, we can maybe just greed the alumni. You know, on one front, we should have actually clicked that uh, chapter like after, before we played the Spellweaver, but it's all right. I don't think it matters in this match. They're pretty strapped for points, right? Taking the heat wave there. Wasn't maybe the right target. We just play that, we take Zeal on the other. Yeah. 
Like, it's not really close. We'll just kill off this card. And I think we'll probably be able to get out of this game with them with zero points. Great Oaks kind of big. Um, still would have played on the end of the row, I think, at that point. Get the two damage on the front row card, but either way, this is just for you guys showing you basically. Here we go. Decent game. Moving on to the next one here. We've got two games left. So this one's going to be Meditating Mages. Pincer Maneuver. And it's pretty much the only deck that you'll see people running this. Whether it's Meditating Mages or Arch Griffin or something like that, it's usually the only options. And I would say Arch Griffin's not really as playable right now. So you have to assume it's Meditating Mages. And because of this, we just we go down, we boost that. I'm feeling pretty good about it. We want to get ours down fast, and then we want to make sure we try and deal with theirs. If they have a defender, that gets difficult, but if not, we have a duel. So this is a really good example for those wondering why I don't, I don't put a defender. Especially in a mirror match. You look at this, mine's already ticking. Right? And we're on turn number two of that right now. And now I'm starting to think about playing mages. And they're starting to think about playing Letitia first. It's kind of annoying though with the defender because I have no way of getting around it. So it's almost like we have to go take a ping off of it and then we gotta go and, you know. And just because Letitia has to go on range, we put the student there because we, well, we want to start working on that. But uh, we definitely want to get the extra ping off the shield so that if we do duel that out, we're not dueling against the shield. So I'm just thinking, if you're playing against a deck that has a Purify for the Defender, then a 5-point removal for the Vengeance, the whole strategy just falls apart. It's kind of tricky. But so far, we haven't seen a Mage. This is what I'm talking about, right? And we're on turn number 3. And there we go, right? Now, we want to work on getting the best patience possible for ourselves, but we also want to be able to temple pass on them, so they have to play down a couple cards to get the best combo that they're looking for, right? So we'll just start playing a few more cards here, just really watching our timers and really watching the score. But a lot of the big strategy for this archetype, like the Meditating Mages, is to try and 
swarm the board with as many of these as possible, then click them all, reset the order, and, you know, and try and do it twice. Play the Adepts round two, try to get all those patience boosts to like six or seven per turn, and just go for the 2-0. So, I'm aware. And I click because I'm thinking, all right, it's probably time that we have to start thinking about getting out of this round. And you see, I go for the pass here. Reason why I go for the pass there is because they haven't clicked for the resilience. So if they want to take the round here on even sure but a lot of this big strategy they went to set up doesn't work at that point so i know that they're probably going to continue to play and um we get our card back regardless and they have to still play down quite a bit to make it worth it because do i really care about nine points of resilience if it means like one or two cards from them or full leader plus an additional card like it's easier to make that back Yeah. So they get the two more. Even so, now we have to think think about it. Like, are the five of those worth the two card deficit? Well, now, now six of them. And all in the meanwhile, like, we're getting the same kind of carryover that they're getting, so it's probably, like, the worst situation would be, like, the mirror match here. Okay, so they get them, that's great. Now we can just defend this uh, 2 0 push with a 5 card advantage in round 2. And I know that if we can answer those adepts, then we're pretty good, right? So we want like the duels and stuff. We want to have the damage in hand. So a couple duels are really nice, yeah. So, if I do take Selkirk here, we do two things. We take care of some of their carryover, but we also take care of maybe the engine value they're going to get from an Adept. So, I feel pretty good about that play here. I think there was a, maybe a mistake, actually, in this round. I was a little bit sidetracked, but... Um, but it had to do with... Um, us taking boost instead of damage I think what I was thinking at the time was we can boost up a duel to get a better duel value if that's what it was if they were going tall with something on the last card but I think it might be this next turn here
really just going for it. Yeah, so this was the play. Um, they didn't have the patience click though, so just kind of a whoops, but it is a lot of points. Um, I just think that we would have benefited more in this event from taking damage because then they would have had one less carryover. You know, going into round three, we could have taken out two of them. However, I don't think it actually matters. Like in the grand scheme of things, we should probably just win this game quite easily. But uh, I think it did cost us a card here. Try and save face and take out one of them at least. There we go. Right? And unfortunately we've got a click. So yeah, I I I um I kind of shot myself in the foot in two things, right? I think we would have been able to get out of this round without clicking the chapter had I put the initial um one on on uh melee. But it's like it's one of those things where it's like, okay, it, it just means we would have won harder. I think we're still going to win the game. But uh, I'm just letting you know, so, you know. If you're new to it, that's how you take the matchup. We don't really want these students in round three. It's really slow. Put them back. And we've got, like, the premium hand. Really, there's not a lot we missed at all, so... Thirteen damage. I could make it even worse with the student. So I believe we have winch left in deck for Shawnee. So if we go play that now, we should be able to pull off a second Shawnee during the match. So that means we can get out another alumni. From the round, like the previous round we played. These mega scopes are slow. That's kind of what you'd want to see in round one, I think. We don't really have to worry about that engine because they only have one card with patience right now. I think we just take the marine. Yeah, just in case, boost it up a little bit. So many points. We had 17 off the one, 17 off the other. We're pulling another 17, like, I want to say we would have won by like a hundred points, um, and that's with making mistakes in round two. We got one more game for the day. This one's going to be Mobilization Northern Realms, and, uh, <laughs> and this is one of the longer videos. So. It's not pincer maneuver at first. I was like blink and what? Oh, mobilization. So the only thing I'm thinking is it's either like a Royal Guard swarm or a Revenant swarm. Usually that's the case. So we're kind of developing a strategy towards that play. The Redanian Elite, not a huge fan of that card just because it's pretty vulnerable. 
if we can somehow get some pings off of it, we're getting huge trades. So. I want to funnel out some of these bronzes ASAP. With this, I would probably go Letitia first before, but I'm trying to go Raffords first now because we didn't have any students in hand. So sometimes you'll come across this. We guys start pulling into them, right? So there we go. We see one. Had I known it would have been the other student, maybe we put it on melee, but uh, this should just wipe the board pretty much. There's the snowman I was talking about. Top right corner, you see? You guys kept telling me in the live stream today to kill the snowman. So satisfying though, it like breaks up in little pieces. But yeah, I guess we just keep playing, right? They went first and Philip is expensive, so We might as well just keep playing, right? I believe they're probably going to try and take this one out too. I see Maddox. I see bombs. I'm thinking, okay. Um, here goes. It's the exact same thing had we played it on melee anyways. Except in this case, if they didn't have a bomb and they just clicked Maddox, then we might have been able to save Rafford's Vengeance. I'm looking at this as a win condition. If we can just ping that down three times now, all of a sudden it looks a lot more difficult than it should be. Well, with this deck at least. But Onslaught would love that, right? Like, they trade up so well. Um, Siege would really like that as well. So I guess the idea was for them to flip it. That's kind of cool. I don't know if it's in there for that sole reason. It's probably a tech for like a spying unit or a Joachim or whatever the case, right? So we're just playing some mind games here, nudging things down to six, trying to make them think we got something going on. Igni in deck. But uh, if they're paying attention, we've already played the Marine, so they could see through it. But we just don't really have a solid target anyways, so that's why I'm just messing around. Like for damage? There's no engines on the board. Okay, so we're actually not that far behind, right? We're like pretty close, two turns back really. So we can keep playing because if we do get a pass, well, we'll try and take Brown and we'll try and bleed them. So it's kind of the idea. What I'm dreading though is if it's Revenants and they have the archers and all that type of stuff, a long round three, 
10 card round three, nothing that we play will live. So that's kind of the idea. It's like, I need to have the round control because I know that's the direction that they're gonna be going. I used to play so much Revenants. So many. And uh, it wouldn't be a bad time to start looking at the carryover from the chapter. Because if we are looking at bleeding as an option or if we're looking at trying to win on even as an option, we want to make sure we get that down quickly. And Letitia hasn't been played because it just doesn't really mean anything here, right? It just isn't going to work out. And the only reason why they continue to play is because they know kind of what the idea of, of what I'm trying to do is. And they know that they don't have that same type of tempo. Yeah, we play chapter, I think. And it's going to be the Spellweaver here. Start getting that damage, start playing those mind tricks. We put this down to a 6 too. Again, it means nothing. So I think that we probably play Letitia on melee. Just because I don't want to play into the Madoc at all. Okay, and I got bored, so I think I just pinged these down at this point. Yeah. There. And if we get the pass we're looking for, well, we just play uh, Gerhardt and call it a day, right? We, play, we take a pact off of it and we're ahead. So that's the idea. All right, so simple enough, right? We take it here. I was just telling chat that I wish I could have had the room to take a pact off the Madoc be slick like that but we didn't now I'm just roping because I'm uh, just end the turn there you go oh. there we go okay so I value the duel quite a bit because if they do Go ahead with archers, go ahead with the revenant. This is our best way to remove that. We have the lock as well, which is really good to see. So not bad. Alumni is better here, but alumni orders are bad. So this game's a really good example of what happens when it doesn't work out, right? So we can go John, Amphibious, and this, that. Now, they might match that with their own Amphibious. There, we gotta get the points out. Patience counters are set. It's funny, we go from a game where they're like 17 and then we go 
to uh, one where there's one. But um, we have other wind conditions. Like, it's a big one, but it's not the only one. And uh, the duels really help. The Raffords really helps as well. Shawnee just helps off the Marine. So there's a few things. Now, I think one of the revs is going to work, which is unfortunate. But uh, we can get rid of the second one. I think we try and get rid of the six. Now, we're a little short on the patience, I believe, right? One and one. It will be two at the end of this turn. So, had I had the room, I would have done it and just removed the back card on their side because I know they're going to self cannibalize there. Just get that every single turn, potentially, off the Ronvid. So, it is what it is. Now, we're still up. I think it's important that we continue to play a little bit more, but we run the risk of getting trapped. It starts with taking a lock here, because if we let them take one more Revenant, then I don't think we ever get out of the round. So I think they're looking for something that'll do 11 points, but I don't know if they have something that'll do 11 points. The heat wave's not enough. And that was something I thought about, right? Okay, what if it's a heat wave? Just isn't enough here. We get the one point difference. And for me, I'm just gonna say that's enough here. Get out of the round because we know that Winch is not gonna do anything besides five points. And we know that they have it. Seeing Darren come down here is huge as well. And we have a scary bad round three hand. Really bad. Winch is horrible here. We need a unit so the student's not bad, but... Practice is not really good either. Because what are the odds that we pull it off? Like, I like the boost amount that it's going to be giving, but then that it means we have to have something stick, which means we have to play the student for four power, and then hope it lasts a turn to then go and you know, do all that. So I'm thinking it's not worth it. Yeah, tuck it back. In deck we have alumni, which is great. But again, they're not really doing much. I think our biggest removal comes from taking the rev here because it doesn't look like much, but if they have a bunch of bronze soldiers or even just soldiers in general, that gets quite expensive. So it's beyond the ceiling of maybe what we would have gotten from even just taking the order on the uh, the Onseus. And we still have the zeal that we can give to something else, like an alumni. So in this case, good example, the order of their card, if it's inspired, it does three damage. Otherwise, it does one damage on order. So I'm thinking, okay, well, now is a really good time to go and take that uh, that alumni, right? We damage that down. And then we can just play the other two and not really care too much about it. Just play them for the points they're worth. And if you stuck around this long, thank you for sticking around. That's a crazy amount of games we have played today. So um, I'm going to be back tomorrow with another video. If you guys have any ideas for what you'd like to see me play over the next week, let me know. I've got a couple things I'm working on. But um, I'm always open for suggestions as well, so definitely keep that one in mind. 
with the students here, we'll be able to play one for four on the back row and then use like one order, but the second one will play for one point. So assuming they damage us by one here, we'll be going down to 12 plus the, uh, the nine, right? It's looking kind of scary. It's a little late, I think, for the archer. That would have been the first take, I think. I think they roped, which is why they self-damaged, because it was a long turn. But um, I don't think the game is decided by one point. Yeah, that'll do it. Decided by a few points. We'll see you tomorrow.